We are joined this half hour by Delegate Gino Chiarelli. Gino, can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you great. You sound good, buddy. How you doing, Gino? I am doing fantastic. And let me just tell you, after listening to the last 10 minutes or so, uh, it feels like I'm right back in the living room of the Delta House listening to you two guys <laughs> argue back and forth over something at like 9.30 at night. Uh, it feels like we never left Charleston. <laughs> and a lot of people don't realize that Mike and I, they kind of pair us together on everything. And we don't usually agree on everything right off the bat. We, we, we like to talk it out. And uh, that's part of what happens down there, right? That's one of the most important things you can do is, is talk about it, especially with people that you're close with. I know that when we have conversations about you guys, it's always Hornby and Height. Ideal, you know, ideological divide aside, you guys are pretty much paired together. So right. it's nice that you guys have this back and forth, this little you know rapport. And I love that I get to be a part of it. And, and if you didn't know better, you would think we were fighting. That's, that's an important thing, too. I know I've seen you guys go at it viciously. And the next thing you know, you stand it up. Hey, what are you doing tomorrow for breakfast? You know, that, that's, that's, that's the sign of grown adults. You know how to disagree, but the next moment, as soon as the, uh, the argument is over, hey, let's go get something to eat. Yep. So, Gina, let's talk about some of the legislation that you introduced uh, last year and some of the things that you are looking to do again this year. Um, what, was the, uh, what was the big uh, bill that you got passed last year? So last well, this year, last session, well, this, 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 this past session, I actually got two bills passed, both of which I think are pretty significant. Um, we got House Bill 4667 across the finish line, across the governor's desk, that prevents these um, harm reduction programs from handing out smoking devices. They can no longer hand out crack pipes, meth pipes, foils, anything that somebody could use to smoke an illicit substance. I know that's a big deal in Morgantown, and we've talked about that extensively. Uh, the other bill that I got passed was House Bill 5188, which relates to the awards and benefits for disability um, as far as municipal police officers and firefighters, meaning if that they're injured on the job, but they're not completely disabled, this bill allows them to collect a partial amount of their, uh, of their disability after their injury. John? So the, before 5188, when firefighters and police were injured, they got nothing? So before how it worked is if you it was determined that you were only partially disabled, but a doctor who or whoever determined that you were still able to um, obtain gainful employment somewhere, you could not. So like a Walmart cashier or a greeter. Yeah, that's that's the one that the, that's the big citation. They say, oh, if you could go be a, something like a Walmart greeter, you have to get that before you can collect anything. The problem is it wasn't based on whether or not you actually did get it. It was only based on whether you could get it. So it doesn't matter if you were an hour and a half from the closest location that you were able to have a job like that. Um, if a doctor or whoever said that you were able to get it, you could not collect that disability until you did. And I, uh, the firefighters came to me with, with this concept. They opened up the code, showed me exactly what needed changed. And for me, it was a no-brainer, and it seems like it was a no-brainer for the rest of the legislature as well. And what does the new law say? The new law says that they're able to collect 40% um, of their disability for a year after their uh, after their you know their their injury, it's not exactly what I asked for in the beginning. But the the people on the finance committee, they're the ones that crunch the numbers. They're the ones that actually take a look at what we can get done. So, firefighters, police officers, from everything that I've seen, from some of the things that have been published afterwards, they're very very happy with this. And uh, if they come back to me and ask me for something else, I'd be more than happy to be on their side. Does this inure to the benefit of fi volunteer firefighters in any way? Unfortunately, no. This is for the professional firefighters and municipal police officers. So talk about uh, some of the legislation that you didn't get uh, across the finish line that you would be looking to uh, maybe reintroduce. So one of, the, one of them that I will definitely be reintroducing is the, uh, the life sentence on fentanyl dealers. That's something that I know that I had a lot of support for. Um, I'll probably be bringing that in, and I know that more Capito talked about that a lot on the, on the, during the governor's um, primary. So I know that that's out there in the, in the zeitgeist. I also had the... Um, the porn ID bill, which we'll, we could talk about, and then the one that I absolutely am going to be resubmitting, the one that I probably get the most calls about, is requiring municipal elections to be held on the same, on regularly scheduled primary or general days. That one will definitely be coming back. And where did that get stuck? Um, was it in judiciary? It, it didn't make it out? Where, 
Because hmm. it made it out of one committee, right? Uh, it made it out of poly subs, and then it went to judiciary. I talked to the chairman, Tom Fast. He said, just told me flat out, which I respect, honestly, said that he wasn't going to run it. Okay, I'll try again next year. Did he give you a reason, Gino? He would not give me a reason. Hmm. He would not. To me, it just makes sense, because one of the biggest reasons why I introduced that bill in the first place is I, I can't help but notice the quality of Morgantown uh, and the, the turn that it has taken for the worse over the last decade or so since I've been here. Uh, and then I look at our municipal election. I look at our city election. It's the third Saturday in April. Nobody knows when it is. We have single-digit turnout uh, in, in, in Morgantown, which is one of the, the bigger uh, urban areas in, in West Virginia. It doesn't seem right to me that only 7% of people are showing up for that election. Um, I want more people to turn out. I want more people to have their eyes on, on these people that are running for, running for these city council positions. Um, and from a fiscal standpoint, I'm not the biggest fiscal hawk in the world, but it just makes sense to have this election on the same day as one that we're already having a bigger one going on. So, Gina, the, the porn ID law, is that the one like Louisiana and Virginia where the, you have to show uh, government, have to provide some kind of ID to say that you're 18 years old in order to access a porn site? Yes, so the initial bill... You know, I thought that one it, actually passed the House. Did it not make it through the House? So so the porn ID bill, it made it through the House after a long, long route. It got detoured. It was um, re-referenced to a committee, recommitted to a committee um, on the floor after second reading. It made it back out thanks to Chairman Daniel Linville. He promised me that it would come out, and it did. It made it to the floor. No discussion on the floor. Passed unanimously. Made it over to the Senate. Um, Charlie Trump took it up in his committee. They made some changes on the Senate, as they so often do. They returned it to us. Um, Tom Fast told me that he didn't like some of the changes that were made. It involved some of the, the legal aspects, which I had to lean on his expertise for. Um, we couldn't get an agreement done in time. Uh, Chairman Linville spoke with the Senate. We finally had agreed upon language, but unfortunately, we ran out of time on the, on the last day. So we, we couldn't actually get it finished. But, John, to answer your question, yeah, this is the original bill that I had was based off of language from Utah's bill. But it, it underwent significant changes, um, all of which I'm, I'm happy with through, as it worked its way through the process. Well, I'm preparing for the show, I, I'm reading through some stuff here. And the Texas version of this is being taken up by the Supreme Court in their next session. So it's might want to show some patience, <laughs> see, see whether or not it gets struck down. I Personally, I think it's a troubled law. Um, I think it's fraught with a lot of issues in, in terms of legal, um, blocking access to legal materials. Uh, it, it's, we'll see. I, I'm going to guess the Supremes, just judging from recent decisions, I'm going to guess the Supremes are going to shoot down the Texas law, but we'll see. You know, yeah, let's, well, let's we're going to have to keep an eye on that because that's going to set a lot of precedent for for us because it's it's a bill like this has already passed in 12 states and it's been at least introduced in, in 32. So this isn't an, uh, an atomized idea. This mm -hmm. is something that is really, really out there. And in I also have some inter very interesting polling data uh, about it. Uh, I'm looking at something from a survey from YouGov that was concluded last week. Over a thousand adults uh, were surveyed. On a total ban on pornography, which is not what this bill does, it pulls it 44 to 44. Among women, it's 48 to 33. With this law specifically, the idea of requiring these companies to use real ID verification, 83% support, 14% opposed from a poll that was conducted last August. Gina, There's a lot of public support for an idea like this. I, I'd like to go back to the, the 4667, the one that you did get passed, and, and uh, about harm reduction. And, and you've been in the harm reduction field, so you know a little bit about, um, you know, what happens uh, with, with that population. Talk a little bit about what inspired you to, uh, to write that law and uh, how you think it's helping now. Sure. So when I first ran, one of the big things that contributed to me wanting to run was I worked at a methadone clinic here in uh, Morgantown. I got a really good view of addiction and what it looks like in a number of different people. And I found out that we found out collectively as a clinic that the harm reduction program just down the street was handing out these um, 
safe smoking kits, they were called. Uh, in them was uh, a meth pipe and foils and uh, a pamphlet with picture instructions on how to smoke meth. We were all very, very disturbed by this, but I really wanted to see it for myself. So I went to the harm reduction clinic myself in Morgantown. Um, I went in there with just a sweater on. I just wanted to see what the process was like. I went in there and I handed them my ID. They took me into the back room after about 15 minutes. And then I left there with a plastic bag full of tourniquets and caps and bubblers. I got all my smoking devices. Um, I didn't speak to a medical professional. I didn't get any sort of treatment planning. There was no coordination of care. There was no specialist referrals. I walked in there and I left with a bag full of stuff. That was it. In order to try and salvage the experience even a little bit, I said, hey, can you guys give me as much educational material as possible just so I have it? So they gave me a flyer for Narcan and they gave me a pamphlet for hepatitis. However, it was entirely cover to cover in Spanish. So the program that they have there and the implementation of it, to me, that is, that's not harm reduction, that's enabling. And this state, we need to do something about the drug addiction. I will continue to beat that drum. Uh, and to me, a program like that isn't helping, it's actively harming people. And was that program getting state funding? I, be, uh, I believe a, lo a lot of their funding came from United Way. I, I don't know, I struggle okay. to find out where a lot of their, their funding comes from, and I don't think that that's not on purpose. Um, and I want to go to the life sentence for fentanyl dealers. That, that kind of makes me happy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> how do we define a fentanyl dealer? What level? The street corner guy, or do we? Is it higher than that? So it would have to be a certain amount that you are that you have. It's not okay. So I'll back up. What I don't believe is that I do not believe that the answer to the drug crisis is throwing every single user in prison. I think that is a, a, a an older thought. I don't think that that works. I think that addiction is largely on the user end a healthcare problem, and there needs to be treatment options for people that actually want to get better. On the flip side, where I think the criminal element comes into play is with this bill specifically, once you meet that threshold, it's determined that you, you, know, you are conspiring to sell, you are selling, you possess a certain amount. That's when I no longer am interested in healthcare problems for you. You're killing our people and you're not going to make money off of it. Something has to be, has to be done. We want people to know in West, uh, about that West Virginia is open for business, not this kind. And I think that we've had had this go on long enough to the point where we need to start taking serious, serious no tolerance measures. Are we talking milligrams, grams, or kilograms? I think seven grams, I think is what I, is something that we, we had. But again, this is why I wanted to go through the committee process. I want us to talk about it. I want a number of different legislators eyes on it so we can come to something that is fair, but still severe. What's the cost of a lifetime in in prison to the state, Gina? Do you have any of that information? I don't have the specific cost of that. However, I cannot imagine it costing the state more right. than the, and then in the long run of unchecked dealers coming in from out of state, continuing to peddle their poison. And is a is a lifetime a set amount of years? I, I don't know. I'm I'm just asking because you know people get out on parole all the time. I guess you get life with. With parole, without parole, I don't know if, if that lifetime is an actual certain certain amount of years. Well, with with me and the, the bill that I have, the bill that I would like to see pass, life, no parole. We need a no tolerance policy when it comes to this kind of thing because we've had it go on for too long. We are doing so many great things in the state. We've had billions and billions of dollars of outside business uh, business investment. The state is growing in, in so many ways. But one of the biggest issues that we still continue to face is this is the drug problem, the demographic problem, our labor force participation rates, and all of which I think are, are affected. Every area of, of economic growth, every area, period, in West Virginia is affected by, by drug addiction. And we have to start doing something. I think we're, we're well past the point of we need to start taking drastic measures. So, Gina, you, have you been watching the uh, RNC? I've caught clips of it here, here and there but I have not been watching it religiously. I trust all of our colleagues that are there to hold down the fort for me. Have you been impressed by any of the uh, speakers so far? You know, I think a lot of it is 
uh, height you pointed out earlier, it's a lot of it is ho hum. I'm not wild about a lot of it. Um, I think that they it feels like they plan to really have this RNC without Trump being there. It seems it doesn't seem like where it, it needs to be. I'm also I'm very unhappy with the uh, the concept of including somebody like Amber Rose there. To me, I don't think that's the type of person that we should have speaking at the RNC, but that's just my personal opinion. You guys know how I am. Yeah, I, I, w- I would agree. Um, some of these, and, and, and I think they've they've had a lot of um, just regular individuals on. Um, and I love it, those. It, and, right, and there's some people like like Mike here that, that love those. I, I find them like, eh, you know. And, and a lot of times here when you're watching, so I guess it depends on the channels you watch too because a lot of times you'll have the, the moderators or, or the speakers uh, behind the scenes well, will talk will over, over top, the top of it. Yeah. So I've been watching on the hill.com um, and, and it's just the raw, so raw feed. Yeah, streaming. Okay. And, and I've been glued to it every single night. I, I haven't been disappointed in, in, in many of it. I think the networks are all geared around what from 9 to 11. That, that's, yeah. Yeah. that's the prime time. I've never been to one of these things, but as I, I know people who have, and they're they're geared to be sort of boring. You know, you you have the you know the mayor of a city somewhere in the Midwest who's speaking at six thirty in the evening that nobody's listening to them, but he gets to go up and and, and give a speech. Mm-hmm. But it's all geared toward that prime time moment that that everybody is there. Uh, I, I would find it an excruciating thing to attend, but I, there's got to be electricity in the air. I don't know what they do during the day, unless it's sleeping off the hangover. I guess, from- it just seems like, from from what I can gather, the the energy has certainly shifted after last Saturday. I mean, they shot the president. Okay, I don't understand why the the, the Republican Party. It doesn't seem like that we're displaying um, the the attitude that we need to have. It doesn't feel like we're we're capitalizing on. You know, what actually happened here? I mean, there are people that are celebrating the attempted murder of, of a candidate, of a former president. And it, I don't know. It, it's, it seems bizarre to me that, that people aren't as concerned about that as they, as they should be. But... I'm not well, this there. has who's, to be who's one celebrating of the, it. This well, there are. I have heard some people right. on the left. A lot of there, but very, very evil, evil, weird. vicious people yeah. are are thrilled. People are getting fired from their jobs. For, for celebrating the attempt over it now. I mean, it's there are people, unfortunately. That oh, are, okay. Are like not, that. It just okay. highlights the. And this is one of the weirdest campaign seasons I think I've ever seen, especially presidential campaign seasons um, from the left or the right. That that. Obviously, Donald Trump makes things a little different from the right, but the left, it seems like I have never seen the left in this much disarray um, this late in, in the season where they're that is such a good That is such a good point yeah. because what we've always seen from them is they are always, for better or worse, they are a hive mind. They yes. are always on the same page. They're always, they always know exactly what each other's thinking. They, they're in lockstep. However, this has been the biggest break for them, in certainly in, in my lifetime, now that you have people stepping out of, out of file, stepping out of line, people like Adam Schiff, who are openly calling for Biden to resign, and then you got Pelosi saying, yeah, I had no idea he was going to do that. Yeah, that they was have, pretty shocking deep, that, that deep she said issues. that. Yeah, I, I, I think that whole areas i'm wondering right now if if uh joe manchin's not thinking to himself maybe i should have gotten into the race maybe i should have run against him maybe i could have exposed this earlier in the primary before the primary i could have exposed the the issues that biden is having and and could have garnered the nomination and we would have a much different race right now if joe manchin was the nominee rather than joe biden it, of oh, course. I, I absolutely <laughs> think we would, yeah. Do you think that would change the dynamic in West Virginia if Joe Manchin was on the ticket? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, I, I do. Too, yeah. Absolutely, and I think I kept trying to say, you know, back before the primary, I think the Democrats are looking for another candidate. They're looking for anybody to come out other than Biden. That there were those who saw him as the frail individual that he has. Well, proved they wouldn't to be, be panicking now if they were looking, because they would have known. 
Right. They, I, during the debates before, if he had to, had to debate somebody. Bernie Sanders was steamrolling toward the nomination. And if it hadn't been for James Clyburn endorsing Biden, they would have had been stuck with Bernie Sanders in 2020. Yeah. And that was their great panic moment because they knew that Bernie Sanders couldn't win. So Biden got it. And he, he said he was going to be a transitional Yes, President, so. that's what he said. Yeah. And then and then he chose Kamala for the reasons he chose Kamala Harris. And she's if if, in fact, he bows out, that's got to be the new candidate. So um, it'll be <laughs> it'll be a very interesting race. If, well, and if this has been happens. an interesting week. We, we talked a little bit about this earlier that, that he he comes out and says, I'm not bowing out unless I have some kind of medical problems. And then, you know, a couple of days later. Oh my gosh, he has COVID. He has medical problems. And now there's a medical issue. Yeah, I, imagine that. It's sort of like it was all set up. No. And, and they're trying to get him a way out to save face and a way out so they can change the nominee. Uh, you know, I, I've just never seen, you know, in my 58 years, I've never seen the, the presidential uh, campaign season go this way on either side. And the sad thing, for, you know, I've never been a fan of Joe Biden, like ever. But he has served the country well, and he's, he's served it for a long time, and the history books are going to record all of this in such an ignominious way for him to... Right, say that word again? Ignominious. Okay. Um, Definition? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Use it in a sentence where I understand it? <laughs> it's an ignominious way to... It, it, it's uh, sad and forgetful. Okay. And um, I don't know. It, it, they, I hope they let him go to just... Let him go to the convention, you know. Maybe going out because he's sick is, is the better way. I don't know, but nobody's going to believe it. It's, it's very sad. It's elder abuse. It really is. Mm. Um, but Hunter and Jill, I, I, I don't know. We'll see. It's... Gina, we got a couple of minutes left. Is there anything else you want to talk to our audience about your plans for the next session? Do you have a, an opponent in the, uh, in the general? In the general. I do have an opponent, actually. Um, she seems to be running on the the same old um, hyper progressive platform that Democrats keep trying here in in West Virginia. Um, they think that they are in. If you ask them, they're in touch with what the people really, truly want. Uh, I don't know how you could logically come to that conclusion, considering that there's what eleven of them in there now. To me, I mean, if people wanted a more progressive platform, there'd be more of them down there. Uh, however, it looks like they're about to be losing even more of their members after after this November. So um, she, I noticed that she's doing this thing, and I don't know if other Democrats are doing it as well, but she's trying to obfuscate what she actually believes in by appealing to these vague generalities about true West Virginia values of minding your business and leaving your neighbor alone and at its face. I think that sounds great, but I think people are starting to get a little bit wise to the fact that when modern Democrats are talking about, we just want to be left alone, they're, of course, referring to their typical playbook of the abortions and the transgenderism and the, the homosexuality issues and, and stuff like that. So I think people are kind of tired of being lied to. I think they're, being, they're tired of um, uh, the lack of transparency when it comes to it, because I think a lot of these Democrats recognize that they can't openly come out and be the progressives that they wish they could be. So uh, they try and, you know, hide. I think that Steve Williams is, is doing that a lot. I think he is um, trying to uh, not be honest about the things that he supports. He just had a long tweet thread about J.D. Vance uh, and how he, his book drove him crazy, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, if you go back to just 2019, Steve's talking about how much he loved the book hmm. on, on Twitter. So I think that I think that people are getting kind of tired of that, and they would rather just have someone come out and be honest about what they believe. That's what I've done, and I've found success so far. So your thoughts, do you think Steve Williams stays in the race, or do you think he bows out to Manchin? I, I think that, that, that it seems to me that the door is closed on that at all. I think right. if Steve really wanted the Democrats to win, he should have done it already. Um, I don't see how him in his position, he could look at his standing in the race and think that he has even anything close to a chance. But who knows? They don't always think the most logically. So I think he's cooked. Tino, thanks so much for your time. I appreciate it. Um, I believe, have you applied to be in Delta House again for next session? <laughs> uh, is your, uh, has he your, got a bag of I'm paraphernalia. All, 
<laughs> I'm on the waiting list. I'm hoping for good results. Yeah. Thanks, Gino. Appreciate it. And uh, I'll talk to you this weekend.